Plan friend, it's been a while since we've talked about terrariums on Bloom and Grow Radio. In fact, the Terrarium 101 episode we had aired almost 130 episodes ago. But privately, I have to tell you, terrariums have played a huge role in my plant collection and life, especially recently. A couple of months ago, I created a good luck terrarium to bring into the recording studio to record my audiobook for Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants. And I had such a special experience planting up this tiny mason jar terrarium, filling it with special plants, stones, and crystals, and carrying it in my backpack like a lunatic all around New York City while I fulfilled this lifelong dream of recording my audiobook. And you know, I think that's what terrariums can do for us. They obviously encapsulate our plants within the confines of the vessel, but they do so much more. They can capture a feeling. They can capture a sense of specialness that a simple potted plant just can't do. We can create entire worlds within a terrarium and even ecosystems that we can escape into for a mindful moment and use to amplify our passion for plants. For my audiobook recording, my little terrarium served as a reminder of my planty inspiration in the somewhat sterile audio booth, but it also represented this community. And plant friends, I have to tell you, I don't know if this sounds silly, but I read that entire book to this jar of potted plants because it represents our shared passion for plants. But here's the thing, plant friends, terrariums come with a whole separate set of care instructions, requirements, and if you want to get into the whole vivarium and paludarium space, which we dive into today, you have to learn how to deal with bugs and animals and creating an ecosystem that everyone can thrive in. So today, I'm so excited to be joined by someone who I've been a fan of for a while, Patricia of Doodlebird Terrariums, a terrarium guru to break down the differences and similarities of terrariums, paludariums, and vivariums, and to ensure that you've got the knowledge you need to set your first one up right after listening. So welcome to episode 154 of Boom and Grow Radio. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had wonderfully planty weeks. As per usual, holy moly, we are less than a month out to the launch of Growing Joy. It is so exciting. Thank you so much to everyone who has pre-ordered. If you haven't pre-ordered, I cordially invite you to order my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants. It's a self-care book about plant care and my love letter to plants. Now that we're really into the growing season as well for you outdoor gardeners, this book is a perfect accompaniment to your growing season, and you can use the 60 plus practices outlined in the book to enrich your gardening experience and hopefully bring more smiles to your faces. So like I said in the intro today, this episode is all on terrariums, paludariums, and vivariums. So it's this is like terrariums 2.0 for people. There's a lot of confusion about what the difference between terrariums, paludariums, and vivariums are. And today, me and Patricia are going to dive deep into the differences, the similarities, and how to set up all of them. Her book is absolutely incredible. We're going to link it in the show notes. I've referred to it many times in the last couple of years. We have so much to cover, so let's dive in. Patricia, welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you today because your publisher reached out to me and sent me your book whenever it was published. And I didn't really think twice about it because I wasn't building a terrarium. But when I got your book and leafed through it, I was so blown away at the level and intricacy of the terrariums that you build. But it's very funny. I find myself going back to your book many times for different things. Like when I was writing my book, I remember going to your book to look at the way you explained the water cycle and kind of the science that you broke down in your book, because it's technically for kids. I feel like the way that you write is really like easy to understand. And so I've, I've used your book as a resource for the last couple of years. So thank you. That is pretty much the best compliment that an author can get. Yes, right. (laughs) So thank you so much. Yeah, that, that makes me really happy. Yeah. And, you know, terrariums are such a popular topic in the plant world. We had a Terrarium 101 episode many years ago, but I have felt like terrariums, paludariums, vivariums have really expanded in the last couple of years. And frankly, I personally didn't know or understand 
the difference between terrarium, paludarium, and vivariums because, and the only reason why I realized it was I did an episode on aquatic gardening about fish tanks and I posted some photos and listeners corrected me saying, oh, that's not a fish tank, that's a paludarium or that's, you're posting a photo of a vivarium. And so that, you know, led me on a Google search and I realized that you were the perfect person to discuss this topic with. So before we dive into all things vivarium, paludarium, terrarium. Let's talk about Patricia for a minute. So can you let us know how you became the plant lady you are today? How I became the plant lady? Well, before I started, I always liked plants. Since I was a little kid, I would garden with my mom. So I I liked plants. But as far as like business, I did painting, I did mural painting. So that wasn't really what I was doing. (laughs) But then at some point I saw on Etsy, somebody had made these little tiny terrariums and they were selling them. So I bought one just basic, you know, with moss. And when I got it in the mail, I just, I'm like, this is the cutest thing. I want to try to start making some. So I went out in the backyard, started peeling off some moss from the ground and started making these terrariums. And I thought, Hmm, I'm going to try and see if I can you know, if anybody else would be interested in this. And they were really popular. So it just kind of started by accident. And then, I don't know, it's evolved over the years. It's been since 2008. So it's been quite a while that I've been doing it. So you've always been a terrarium girl. Terrariums are kind of what brought you, cultivated your interest in plants or your development in plants. Yeah, for sure. I love terrariums because I feel like it's a it's a unique way to garden. You can replicate like a big garden on a small scale. Anything miniature, I love that type of thing. So, I just I like the the fact that they're also like decorative, you know? You can a nice conversation piece or something cute that you can put in your home and have plants. I don't know. Just something I love. Yeah, they're a great way to to care for plants that need more humidity. And in research for my book, which is all about the plant person connection, I came across this concept called miniaturization when figuring out how to, if you want to use plants to build a restorative environment, you need extent, you need this ability to feel like you're immersed in nature to help be restored, to help it have that restorative effect. And if you can't do that, there's a concept of miniaturization where you build a natural world in a terrarium basically, and give yourself this opportunity to escape in a scene of a terrarium or in a fish tank that has plants in it, or in something that can represent an expansive natural setting that you could keep by your desk or something. And once I learned that research That made me even more interested in terrariums because, you know, you might just think of them as these little cute decorative things, but actually they could be restorative and they could even be part of your self-care strategy for your work day or, or something. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I love that. I love that concept. And it's true. It not only is having the terrarium good for your soul, making a terrarium, you know, working with your hands, being creative, that's also really great for just getting away from kind of how this world is now. (laughs) Totally. Especially when you're using those tools to get through skinny holes or something, you can't be multitasking. It's really a monotask. (laughs) You can put your phone away and really focus on creating it and making sure that you get the figures just right. And that, you know, you make sure that the plants are correctly planted. So let's get ahead of this first, because we're going to be using these words throughout our whole interview. Terrarium versus paludarium versus vivarium. Are all of those terrariums and then their subsects, or are they all separate things? They're all terrariums, really, but it kind of depends on who's referring to these things. So like in the plant community, a terrarium usually refers to like a small jar or a small fishbowl or something like that, that has just plants inside. And it's not going to house like any type of pet or or anything like that. You can have, it can be bioactive, meaning you can put little critters in there that are kind of like a cleanup crew and keep it everything nice and tidy, but it's not for a pet per se. Whereas like a vivarium, generally speaking, 
has pets, frogs, lizards, things like that, but also plants. And it's the vivarium is usually a lot bigger than a terrarium. And then a paludarium, like you mentioned, is it's a type of vivarium, usually also big, but it incorporates both terrestrial and aquatic elements into it. So it's you're having an aquarium and a terrarium all mixed in one. And it often does house like animals, maybe fish or again, lizards or frogs up in the top part <laughs> of it. It can be done on a small scale too, but you know, like technic, if you want to be technical, a uh, paludarium is usually a bigger enclosure. Okay. And then an aquarium would be something that's fully submerged underwater. So that's the yeah. difference between those two. So it sounds like terrariums are kind of the all encompassing. You're growing under glass, you're growing in a container. Then if you add a living element, like a pet, a frog, an above ground living element, then you've got a vivarium because vive to live, right? Exactly. Yep. Then if you're adding an aquatic element, that makes it a paludarium. So if there's a water element, that makes it a paludarium. Exactly. A paludarium with fish would also kind of be a vivarium because it's got living fish in it. Right. <laughs> okay. Got it. Yeah. And people can be nitpicky about this, but that's like like why I said in the plant community, this is generally how it's referred to. Because in the non-plant community, if some random person has their lizard and they say, oh, he lives in a terrarium, everybody understands that that's some sort of tank and it doesn't even necessarily have to have plants in it. But that's not the true, in the true sense of the word terrarium, like terra, it's, it should have plants inside. Got it. Okay. So let's talk about why any of these, so any all-encompassing terrarium growing under glass, what are the benefits and what are the problems that can arise with growing in this manner? Well, there's lots of benefits. One of the benefits is like in a terrarium, you get to house plants that you might not otherwise be able to keep in a home. And that's because most of these plants, these miniature plants, they usually need high humidity. And that's why you don't see them in the stores. If you were to try to grow it as a house plant, it would die very fast because we have heating, we have air conditioning, and that dries out our air right away. So one of the main benefits is being able to grow really cool plants that you might not otherwise be able to grow. And the issues that I see most commonly in growing in a terrarium setting, well, the first one would be mold. That's the most common because it's a warm and humid environment and it's perfect. It's perfect conditions for mold to take over. And what happens in such a small environment is that's exactly what it does. It takes over and it can start to eat away at your plants mm -hmm. and you don't want that. So you can avoid that by not using biodegradable items in your terrarium. So for example, um, sticks, leaves, pine cones, things like that, they're going to decompose very quickly. And mold's job in nature is to decompose things. So you're going to attract more mold that way and it can get out of control quickly. So don't use those things, especially especially in the small enclosed like jars. If it's in a vivarium, usually there's some sort of like airflow coming through. Those things would be more okay in that situation. But one important aspect of keeping your terrarium healthy and combating mold at the same time is making it bioactive. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned before, what that means is just adding little creatures, <laughs> little insects. Of course, they're probably technically not insects, but their main food source is mold or decomposing matter. So two of them that are used most commonly are springtails, which are really teeny, teeny, tiny, and um, isopods, which are a little bit bigger I don't know if you have seen roly polies around your house. Those are isopods. And so they can they can go in there and they like to eat on decaying whatever. So do you buy their larva and put the larva in the terrarium before you seal it? 
If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. No, um, they actually come already, you know, like adults. Uh, You can, the best place to get them is any like pet store or online places that specialize in reptiles Mm -hmm. or vivariums specifically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the springtail, actually both, they're really cute and they're fun to watch. And and so it's kind of neat to put those in there and see them get to work. They're hardworking, just like ants. <laughs> That's so cool. It's interesting. We just did a carnivorous plant episode and our guest Damon from California Carnivores was talking about how carnivorous plants are overlooked as a fantastic fungus gnat mitigator because the fungus gnats stick to the sundews, their sticky leaves. And that's a great way to deal with a fungus gnat infestation. Yes. So it's interesting now learning that you can use beneficial insects to deal with molds because I feel like I actually didn't really know that. And, or I'd seen it in your book, but I didn't, didn't really think too much about it, but that's my biggest issue with all of the terrariums I've had is that they can get moldy and I don't know what to do. So that's really interesting. Okay. All right. We've already learned (laughs) one major tip before we dive into the how to's, I have to tell you a crazy, happy plant lady story. I was a professional musical theater performer for the last decade before I took bloom and grow full time in the pandemic. And I was getting some anxiety around auditions. Um, This was after I started bloom and grow. And this is after I became a, a really obsessed plant lady. And I had a life coach recommend what it, well, if plants are, what's bringing you joy, bring plants to an audition. Like, can you bring a plant in your purse to the audition with you? And I was like, that sounds insane, but I'll try (laughs) it. I was like, at that point, I'd try anything. So I made a terrarium after my first terrarium episode with a cutting of a watermelon peperomia that I had. And it was so simple. It was a bell. It was a jar. It was one of those, you know, ball jars with soil and one cutting of a peperomia. It wasn't extensive at all. Uh And I had its little lid and I, every audition I had, I would stick this little terrarium in my backpack or in my purse and have it in my backpack before I went into my audition. And it just like would make me giggle that I had this crazy weird secret that I had a plant (laughs) in my backpack. I think that's great. That that, that makes me so happy. (laughs) Yeah. So I would say another benefit of terrariums is that they could be portable. (laughs) True. They can be. Yeah. If you travel for work, if you're, if you're traveling a lot, if you miss, if you miss your plants, you can just throw them in a jar and take them with you. Okay. So let's dive into general setups is setting up all three of these types of terrariums the same, or do they require different materials and setups? Yeah, they really require different materials and it it kind of goes in levels. So the easiest one is going to be a terrarium and then the step up from there is a vivarium. And then the paludarium kind of has even more things that you have to consider. Okay. So let's, why don't we work our way through each of those and discuss setup and general care. So Let's start with terrariums. And obviously you have a fantastic book we'll talk about. I've already fangirled about it. That really walks you through. The thing I love about your book is that 
you have these different terrarium setups and then you walk us through with photos of what I'm assuming are your kids maybe doing these projects together, but you give great step-by-step instructions with visuals, but we could talk about like general overview setup. So yeah, basic terrarium need to know, give us a scoop. Okay, well, the scoop is <laughs> for materials, I'll tell you what I use the most. I use tongs. So these are aquarium tongs. They're long, they're about 12 inches long. Mm-hmm. And that allows you to get into small spaces without putting like your fat hand in there mm-hmm. <laughs> and messing everything up. So that's like the number one tool that I use all the time. Secondly, a spray bottle. I like the spray bottles that have the little nozzle that you can change so that it's either a stream or a fine mist spray because I use it for different things. And I fill that with distilled water and distilled water or reverse osmosis water. It's not only good for your plants, but it keeps those hard water stains from forming inside the glass, which you don't want because then you can't see inside. And then I use scissors. And I I think those are basically the tools and then like supplies you would need would be obviously the container, the glass container. Then you want to create a drainage layer. So for that, I either use pebbles or horticultural charcoal. And the nice thing about the charcoal, if you use that as a drainage layer, keeps things kind of fresh inside and smelling a little bit better. And then the next thing you'll need is a peat or cocoa core base soil with some something for aeration added. So I usually use perlite or something similar. And that's about it. That's the supplies that you need for a terrarium. Mm -hmm. With terrariums, let's talk a little bit about the wild world of glass containers that you could have, (laughs) because you could have an open terrarium or a closed terrarium. So what do we need to know for both of those? Okay, so that all comes down to what plants you're going to choose. That will tell you what type of jar you're going to want to get. So I always tell people when you're planning a terrarium, make a list of the plants that you want to use and then Google or whatever, you know, consult a book that, you know, or whatever it is to find out what are the needs, the growing needs or conditions that that plant needs. For example, water light, size, what is their habitat? If you can find on that list several that go together, then let's say all of these plants are plants that need high humidity. Then you want to choose a jar that has a lid because that'll keep all of the humidity inside. If the plants that you've chosen don't, they, you know, they like to dry out a little bit, or even if you're doing succulents or something like that, well, then you would want to choose a jar that's open. Okay. And where do you like to source your containers? Any, and I found that like estate sales, you can find the coolest contain glass containers sometimes for really cheap. Yeah. I totally agree with like garage sales or anything like that. If that's your thing, secondhand stores often have really cool like vintage ones that you can't get anymore so I I, because a vase I mean how many glass vases do you see at the thrift store every time you go but that's perfect for a terrarium yeah exactly so I like doing that when I have the time otherwise if you want a place that usually has a really good selection is um, home goods or TJ Maxx or they're all kind of the same company or what is the other company Marshall's my husband's favorite store. He's he loves Marshalls. <laughs> <laughs> so they they often have really cool selection and not expensive at all. So I like shopping there. And then of, of course craft stores and things usually have glass. Okay. Got it. So those are some good places that you can look, but you could start like I did literally taking a ball jar from my kitchen and I screwed the, you know, silver top on top of it. And it was so rudimentary. I didn't have tongs, but I used normal tweezers and I took a fork and I stuck a cork on top of it. And that was my damper to, to, put, to, it's, Press Perfect. the soil down. Yeah. I mean, and and use what you have. I mean, if all you have is the spoons and forks that you eat with, I mean, use those tools. They'll work. You know, why yeah. not? So. Yeah. I love it. So you've walked us through that. 
now let's talk plants because you were saying high humidity versus low humidity. Are there any plants that you don't recommend putting in a terrarium, any type of terrarium? The only one that I, you know, types of plants, obviously, if the size, if they get huge, you can put them in a terrarium when they're small, but you have to consider that you're either going to have to be constantly sizing up or just don't use those. (laughs) And then generally, like, I I don't recommend cactus and succulents at all for the closed terrariums. And if you have them in one without a lid, it should really be more like almost like a bowl Mm -hmm. instead of covered. They, They don't need the humidity. So traditionally, those types of plants wouldn't have been used in a terrarium. We do it now in this modern day, but you have to consider that it's going to be more like a dish garden rather than a terrarium, a true terrarium. Yeah. I feel like in general with terrariums, I mean, if you have a certain plant you want to put in there, great. But I feel like the the main benefit of terrariums is that they do provide, you know, all we want to do is care for these high humidity plants as houseplant parents. And it's so hard to to keep that going. So I think taking advantage of the high humidity and choosing humidity loving plants is probably your smartest bet. Yeah, I agree completely. Let's talk about now. I've also found when choosing plants for a terrarium, the terrarium plant section of the nursery, if you have a good, you know, nursery that has the little two inch pots, I've also found sometimes you can find plants in the terrarium section that you can't find elsewhere that you could just keep as house plants, rarer plants. Do you find that? Yes, exactly. Like I have different ones that I have that were exactly like you say, you would never find a big one and it's like $2 or something. Exactly. And they have, yeah, they have cool things. So I always check the fairy garden area or the terrarium plant area for cool plants. Totally. But do you recommend buying a two inch plant and starting smaller, knowing that the plant is going to grow into the space? Yes. I mean, it doesn't have to be that small. Let's say you have like a huge jug that you're using. I I actually have one like that here. I mean, a couple of the plants were more like in three, four inch pots, but it was because I was working in such a large scale. But if you're working on a small scale, yeah, start small and then you can, you get to see it grow. And that's like half the fun of a terrarium. Totally. In an open terrarium, do you recommend using beneficial insects or are they going to jump out of the open terrarium? In an open terrarium, you can use them. It depends. Like if you're doing a desert terrarium with succulents, then no, it's not necessary because you're not going to have any problems with mold in that environment. But let's say you have a semi and closed terrarium where it is still humid inside and things can rot, the mold can form, then yeah, they won't climb out, especially the the springtails. I'm not so sure about isopods (laughs) because they're a little bit bigger, but um, springtails, they can't live outside a terrarium or outside a humid environment for more than, I don't know, maybe an hour or something. They'll dry up and die. And they're so tiny, like you, you, not even going to notice if they do jump out. Okay. Got it. And you mentioned a desert terrarium scape. You have the most amazing like landscapes that you build. You build out full scenes in your terrariums. What about sand? Because I see like decorative sand put on top of soil a lot. You have one in your book. That's like a snow scene that you use, I think white sand for, or now you see these kind of desert terrarium landscapes that are more popular, even though you don't need to put cacti in a terrarium. Um, What's the general rule of thumb with how much soil you put versus how much sand? Me personally, I use sand decoratively. So, you know, I don't use a whole lot of it and I'm not covering, you know, all of the terrarium with, or all of the soil underneath with sand. I might use it to create like little pathways or something in the scenes. I know there's other terrarium artists that use what it looks like a lot more sand, like they'll do layers. And that's, again, that's decorative still. It's not really serving a purpose unless you're growing like those cactus and stuff, then they need that sand, you know, that sandy soil in there. But yeah, it's pretty decorative. Okay, got it. Thank you to our episode sponsors, Territorial Seed Company and Espoma Organic. 
Okay, plant friends, so everyone knows that spring is the prime time for starting your garden for harvest in the summer, but did you know that with the right timing and varieties, in many places, you can actually grow plants year-round or at least extend your season beyond what you probably think you can? Territorial Seed Company carries a special selection of vegetable, flower, and herb seeds that are perfect to start in the summer throughout the fall to harvest in the late fall, winter, and even over winter. So that includes includes plants like brassicas, root crops, lettuce and greens, onions, and what something that they're hugely known for is their wide selection of garlic. It is one of the gems of the winter garden. You plant it in the fall and you harvest the following summer. And seriously, plant friends, Melody grew like a million bulbs of garlic in her garden last year, and nothing beats pulling up a full head of garlic and drying it out and then tasting that fresh garlic. It is such a rewarding experience. For 40 years, Territorial Seed Company has been helping enable gardeners to be more self-sufficient, providing everything necessary to grow bountiful, great-tasting, fresh-from-the-garden food year-round. And because they're friends of Bloom & Grow, they're offering us an exclusive coupon code for listeners for 10% off. That's GROW10 at checkout. So GROW10 at checkout at territorialseed.com for 10% off your order. Espoma Organics is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. We know that I love all of Espoma's products, but as we're deep in the throes of gardening season right now, I want to talk about all of the different potting mixes that they have suited for whatever style of gardening you do, whether it's in-ground gardening, raised beds, containers on your patio, or if you're an indoor gardener with an amazing array of houseplants, Espoma has specific potting mixes tailor-made for however you're gardening. Plus, in addition to those potting mixes, they have compost and fertilizers to give your plants all the nutrition that they need to thrive. When you first pot your plants up, I recommend using their Biotone Starter Plus fertilizer. You mix that in with the potting mix as you pot up your plants. That helps the plants establish faster. And then as you go through your growing season, you can use their line of tone fertilizers that are tailored to whatever you're gardening. Tomato tone, flower tone, citrus tone, bulb tone. They literally have a tone for everything and you just sprinkle the tone on top of your potting mix or in your garden beds. Melody and I last year used garden tone in addition to the compost all over her garden. This year, I'm definitely potting up everything with Biotone starter, and then I'll go ahead and take care of my tomatoes with tomato tone for sure. I've been doing that for years. So to learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to check out the Bloom and Grow Espoma Amazon storefront for a curated list of my favorite products. Do you have any tips for planting up the plants? So you've got your layers of horticultural charcoal, pebbles, soil, and then you've got whatever plants. So what's your strategy for planting up a terrarium? Well, you asked a little bit ago about how much soil to put in. Usually I would say if you're looking at the container in percentages, like you cover about 20% of it at the bottom with soil. So It's just so hard. It depends on the size, but let's say you have a canning jar, like you were saying. So you might do half an inch to an inch of a drainage layer, whether that be pebbles or horticultural charcoal or both, whatever you want to do. And then on top of that, maybe two to three inches of soil. And then you can put your plants in that. So the ratio is less drainage layer, a little bit more soil so that the roots can Mm -hmm. spread out, you know, for your plants. And then the rest of the space is obviously for the the leafy area. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So is there a minimum drainage layer amount that you recommend? Not really. It's, I mean, and that can be, it serves a purpose, but it can also be decorative. I mean, you can do something really pretty down there. So sometimes if you're creating something, you want that to show more, you can do more, but you know, it shouldn't be so thin that it's not really going to serve a purpose. The purpose is that if you overwater, let's say the water goes through and goes to that drainage layer down below, Mm -hmm. because there's no hole in the bottom, like you would have in a house plant pot. So the water will sit down there away from the roots. And that way you're avoiding root rot, which is a big problem, whether it's a terrarium or not a terrarium for people. Okay. 
And do you have certain amounts of plants? Like, do you like to always plant three plants together for the rule of three? Or do you like a certain percentage of the landscape to be covered in plants? Or it's really choose your own adventure. You can choose your own adventure. But personally, I like the rule of three because it's just, it's, it balances. It looks Mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. But you also want to consider like, again, how big are these plants going to get? And can you fit all that in there? So consider that before you stuff too much in there, because before you know it, you'll have (laughs) no air space at all. Totally. Totally. Okay. Yeah. I know you see these photos of these like old terrariums that were planted in the seventies that are just like filled to the brink with plants, (laughs) like with like pothos that are so cool, but okay. That's very interesting. So let's talk a little bit about watering. What are your best practices for watering terrariums? I promote using distilled water. I mentioned that earlier. And a lot of people kind of him and haw over that. Well, do I have to? And all this stuff. You don't have to, of course not. But it's better for your plants because in tap water, you know, there's all kinds of chemicals and things. That's why you get hard water stains. It's hard water. And that's more difficult for your plants to process. But keep in mind that in a terrarium, again, there's no drainage hole. So none of that is coming out. It's staying in there all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you're not using a, you can use spring water, you can use rain water. For me, distilled water is cheap. I get a, a gallon of it for like $2. And I mean, unless you have 8 million terrariums like me, which I'm sure you don't, <laughs> you're not going to be using a lot. So it's not a big expense, you know, just go to the grocery store and, and get that and use it. <laughs> and the other aspect of watering, I guess I'll mention is that depending on the plants, like I'll use a spray bottle for moss, for example, most mm-hmm. of my terrariums um, that I sell are moss based. And so I use just a spray bottle to to keep the top portion moist. If you have rooted plants, you can still use a spray bottle, but every now and then, you know, pour some into the soil so that those roots can really soak up the water. Yeah, I would imagine it's a fine line between making sure the roots get enough water, but also making sure not to overwater and then have a bunch of water sitting in that drainage layer. Yes, exactly. And that's, again, where I like the spray bottle. Like if you set it to that um, stream, you know, the hard stream, and just kind of spray around the edges of the glass, it'll go down into the soil, soak down in there, but you're also cleaning at the same time, I might add. But you're not going to, you know, risk overwatering that way. Most, you know, most likely. And then what about closed terrariums? How often do you recommend opening it and giving, refreshing the water and maybe refreshing the air circulation? Yeah. So that's going to vary from container to container for some reason. Um, Some containers hold it in. Like if you have a, I think it's called hermetically sealed container, like with a really good seal on there. I mean, it can go years and you don't, you won't need to water. And then others with like some lid that's just, you know, loosely sitting on top. I mean, you could need to water every few weeks. It just, it depends. But if you're seeing any kind of condensation, which is healthy, by the way, people get a little bit upset that they're seeing that fog on the glass, but it's okay. It's good. It means there's a water cycle Mm -hmm. going on. If you're seeing that, then you don't need to water that there's some moisture in there and it's recycling throughout the glass jar. But if it starts to get where you're not seeing that, or I mean, obviously if the plants look wilty, then yeah, it's time to water. Love that. And do you have any favorite plants that you like to recommend specifically for terrariums? Yes. (laughs) I love moss. Um, If that wasn't already obvious, moss is a great plant to start with and you can get it for free. You just go outside and see what you have in your backyard. There's also people that sell moss. There's certain mosses that do a little bit better in terrariums. And I talk about that in the book, but yeah, that would be my favorite. And then besides that, small orchids work really well. There's even um, miniature orchids that a lot of people aren't aware that even exist. They're only an inch or two high and they, they get really pretty flowers. And usually those types need 
really high humidity, so they can be good candidates for terrariums. Peperomia ripple is, or they call it the radiator plant, I think. That one, if you have a bigger jar, it, it just really, really loves mm-hmm. the terrarium environment. I My favorite terrarium, actually, that I have, um, I've had now for several years, and it's just full of peperomia <laughs> ripple, and it loves it in there. It's really beautiful. So that's one that I like. Asparagus fern, The there's a few different types, but the one that kind of like is leafy, like not the foxtail looking ones, but the other ones, those are really good for terrariums. There's another plant called Biophytum sensitivum, which is looks like a tiny palm tree. It's just the coolest plant. You can probably find that online. And then let's see, jewel orchids are great. And creeping fig, which is another common one you can find anywhere. That's a great one. Yeah. I was at the nursery the other day and I saw all these beautiful jewel orchids and I'm on a bit of a plant pause right now, so I didn't buy them, but this conversation is making me want to make another terrarium. So I might go back and get it. (laughs) Um, Okay, cool. So that's a great overview of terrariums. Let's move on to vivariums. So we want to up our game and we want to turn our little terrarium passion into a vivarium passion. Where do we even begin? How do we approach this differently than the terrarium? Okay, so with a vivarium, usually that's bigger scale. So you can get something that's several feet a glass box. Like a fish tank kind of like big glass box. Yeah. A lot of times they have doors that are on the front side. So you can just open those up and then get right into the the plants inside, which make it easy. Usually you're going to want to invest in some sort of lighting. Some of them come with lighting because, you know, you're not going to place this huge thing in the window. And the fun thing about vivariums, you can get really technical. Like um, on mine, I have a misting system, which goes off on a timer, like, you know, every few hours and it takes care of watering for me. All I have to do is fill the reservoir and I'm good to go. That's about once a month. So is that a feature that came with the vivarium that you bought? I bought it separately, but the vivarium that I bought had like holes, you know, where it, where the things should go. So it was prepared for having a misting system. Another thing that you can add to it is a fogger, which is kind of fun. Yeah. What's the difference between a fogger and a mister? So the misting system, it's basically, it looks almost like if you were to put a spray bottle and just spray, (laughs) it's a spray that like the plants are, are getting some rain in there. But a fogger is just like what it sounds like. It creates fog inside. So it's such a fine, fine, fine mist of of water that it doesn't quite drench them as much as like a misting system, but it raises the humidity really high. And most of these plants that you're going to use in a vivarium just love that. And for a vivarium, you can decorate it with driftwood. The backing of my vivarium I put cork like up against the back I glued it back there and then kind of with a knife I kind of um, sculpted it out the way I wanted it so it looked more natural Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can set plants growing from back there cool so that's kind of fun when you mentioned driftwood are you worried about it rotting and decomposing or on a larger scale like that Because it's a larger piece of driftwood, it's not that big of a deal with mold. No, that's a great question. And it can get moldy. But the nice thing about most vivariums is that, um, and I forgot to mention that it will also have air circulation fans. They're really like, they're not very strong, but they do circulate the air. And then there's also like screened in portions that you can leave open. So that, that leaves for airflow. And what airflow will do is make it a little bit harder for mold to grow. And um, of course, in a vivarium, you're going to want to be using those beneficial insects we talked about, and they'll take care of the rest. Okay. So speaking of insects and the living things we're going to put in there, one of our garden society members, Marsha asked, what is the best starter pet to put in a vivarium? So what are the best starter living animals that you would suggest, you know, someone like me trying for the first time? I think that 
well, I like frogs personally. I really, <laughs> so you can do some type of like a tree frog. And then if you do your research, you can even do like poison arrow frogs, which are really colorful. So those are fun. There's certain lizards that would be appropriate for that environment. If it's not too wet inside, I've actually had praying mantises before. I, lo- I know I'm weird, but seriously, they're just the cutest things. They have so much personality. So if you're a bug person, you can <laughs> do stuff like that. But yeah, I would say frogs would be most appropriate. Yeah, especially if you could like take it out and play with it and yeah, then put it back of in. Course. <laughs> of course. That's so fun. And then what do you do with the excrement of these animals? Are you cleaning it like you would clean a cage or are you using the excrement to decompose and fertilize the soil? Yes and yes. Um, (laughs) So you do do some cleaning, yes, from time to time, but it also does fertilize the soil and the plants. But the third element in there is the isopods. If you're using isopods, they love to eat the poop. They they'll go after it. And so they really are like a great cleanup crew. It's not just mold that they take care of, but they'll take care of less desirable aspects of having a pet as well. I love that too, because it's really kind of mimicking nature. The fact that you're trying to get as much of a cyclical system in place as possible is kind of cool. It is cool. It's cool to learn about. I mean, as kids, we learned about this in school, but I got, you know, when I wrote my book and I was, I had to do some research just to make sure what I was saying was right, you know, that I remembered right. And it was just so cool to learn about it and see it in action. Science is cool. Yeah. Science is totally cool. I love that. Okay. What else do we need to know about vivariums? With vivariums, you can use some bigger plants than you would in a terrarium, in a smaller terrarium. So that's kind of exciting. One that I really like is a bromeliad called Neorogelia. They just don't get quite as big as those big, huge ones that you see, like for landscaping and stuff. But you can use those and they're really colorful. And in fact, if you have frogs, particularly dart frogs they'll even breed in the little cups at the center Aww. that hold water yeah yeah so that's one plant that i really like um you can you can, but you can use really like you know right now anthuriums are really popular in the plant world um plant community and So you can use some of those like collector plants in there because you'll have the space. And the great thing is that a lot of these plants, they need that really high humidity and we struggle with that inside the home. So it's a perfect home for some of these. Yeah, I would imagine ferns too. Ferns, I struggle with so much, but ferns could be great. Oh yeah, they they love that environment. In fact, (laughs) when I planted it up, the one that I have, I don't even know where the fern spores were, what they were on, but all of a sudden I've got these ferns popping up everywhere that I never planted. Wow, Um, that's interesting. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what it was on, but they just started growing in there. So, yeah. That's so cool. And in terms of feeding the animals, how are you doing that in the vivarium? Are they eating the plants or are you giving them food? No, no. Most of them are carnivorous animals. And so, yeah, you have to provide bugs, um, live bugs, because most of them aren't going to eat anything dead, (laughs) unfortunately. So, yeah, it depends on the animal. Um, Some you can just get crickets at the pet store. If you're talking about dart frogs, they eat wingless fruit flies. So that means that they're not going to be flying around your house, but they just eat little itty bitty, you know, these little itty bitty flies and those sometimes are at pet stores and sometimes you have to order online, but yep. Got to feed them bugs. Okay. (laughs) And the cool thing I like about the idea of a vivarium or a larger terrarium is you can really, and this is something you dive into how to do in your book, but you can like really landscape, you could make hills and have all sorts of different textures of different plants and have little scenes, you know, with all the cute terrarium things you can get on the internet, like little benches or little gnomes or, you know, little scenes with, with little figurines that you could build out as well, which, which is really fun. 
Yeah, it is fun. In the vivarium I have, I, I have this little figurine of a hanging sloth, like the, it Aww. has like its arm up, you know? And so I just put it on one of the branches in there and he's hanging out in there. So it looks like he's in this jungle. It's kind of cool. That's so cute. Do you have any recommended resources for finding those really cute terrarium, like figurines and accessories? Yeah, I, you know, you can go to, um, if you want the really tiny ones, you can go to any website that sells miniature train accessories. Um, they have little people, little, just little everything. And so you can decorate with those. Otherwise, a lot of toy companies make little tiny like animal figurines or, you know, maybe a couple inches like my sloth. And so you can get things there, toy stores, <laughs> um, but also like, you know, Amazon or something like that. You can do a search and find some cool stuff. Love it. Okay, cool. Anything else before we move on to Paludarium? I don't think so. All right. So let's get aquatic with it. So we've got our poison dart frog set up, but now we want to add a water feature. What I guess is the biggest difference when installing a paludarium, which has an aquatic feature versus the vivarium. Yeah. So you can get, you know, quote unquote vivarium or terrarium, one of those big cases that have a specific reservoir at the bottom where you can put water if you like the one I have does not have that, it would be very difficult for me to like try to add that after. So try to look for something that has that space at the bottom that will hold, you know, a certain amount of water inside. So is there a way to build in your own water reservoir into any old glass cabinet or case? Or if you're building a paludarium, you really recommend getting something that has the built-in water feature? Because I'm assuming maybe that it comes with a pump or a filter too. Yeah. And you do need those things. Yeah. I recommend obviously to make your job easier, looking for something that has that. Another option is actually just taking an aquarium tank and then building out the top of that with a bunch of um, maybe driftwood or something, building it up out of the tank and then planting plants up in that. That would be another Technically, it would be called a paludarium as well. Oh, so if you were to plant an aquarium, sorry, if you were to fill an aquarium, stick a huge rock in it to elevate and yes. get above water and then build something on top of that rock or driftwood, like you said, that's an interesting idea too. Yeah. To have an underwater and an above water setting. Yeah, like that's more like the one that I have in my book, which is pretty basic model of a paludarium, but it's a bowl with water in it. And then just some of the plants and some of the rocks come up out of the water. So that might be a, a little bit easier of a, a way to do things than the other option. And what do you need to know in regards to the water if you wanted to try one? Do you have to clean the water? Um, do you have to change the water? Yes. And yes, um, it's, it's more involved. Like I have just an aquarium with some fish in it down in my studio. And um, it's probably, I love my fishies, but it's probably my least favorite thing <laughs> because there's just so much that you have to think about. The water has to be right for the fish, first of all. So you have to treat it, it has to be the right temperature. You're going to need a heater. And this is all if you're if you're planning on adding fish or something live. It's not quite as involved with just plants, but you still need to think about, like you mentioned, the pump. Algae. Yes, algae. So you gotta you do have to clean it. It grows like incredibly fast. So you're always cleaning it. You have to um, suck out the water and put more water back in. I'm not making this sound very good. It's a really cool, it's a really no, cool. No, you're concept. being honest. I appreciate your honesty. I mean, it's a big investment if someone was to buy a, a paludarium rig set up. So yeah. it's good that you're being honest. Yeah, it really is. But the payoff is they look absolutely amazing and you can, yeah, do a lot of fun things. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. So, okay. I've picked your brain enough about these different things. You have such detailed instructions and literally how to do every little bit of terrarium building. If people want to buy your book, we'll link it in the show notes, but are there any other common problems that you see people that you're always getting questions about that you want to, you know, address? 
Yeah, for sure. There are four main things that I hear on a regular basis or get questions about. The first one is mold. We we talked about that. It can be a huge problem, especially in the smaller setups, the smaller decorative terrariums. And so, you know, we talked about the way that you can avoid having mold in your terrarium is by not using the biodegradable elements, sticks, things like that, leaves, whatever. I mean, dead leaves, obviously. And then also having the addition of springtails in particular, adding those to your terrarium, it'll, it'll keep things healthy. The next thing that I see people do, I don't necessarily get questions about it, but I see people doing this and and it's a bad idea (laughs) is either putting these glass terrariums in direct sunlight or in complete darkness, you know, going from one extreme or have, you know, to the other, neither one of those is a good idea. First of all, you put a glass, any, like you sit in the car and don't, you know, in the middle of summer, you're going to bake to death kind of the same concept if you're putting this terrarium in direct sun like a south window or something um you're gonna bake your plants and and it's you know bye-bye terrarium bye-bye terrarium (laughs) (laughs) bye-bye okay but you don't want to put it in complete darkness either I mean these are low light plants usually but it doesn't mean no light plants so the same applies for your tropical house plants put it in a you know bright and direct light is perfect you might be able to get away with a little bit less with mo- uh, moss or something, but yeah, not in complete darkness. <laughs> okay. The next thing that I see people run into problem is housing inappropriate plants in terrariums. So they'll do a closed terrarium and then put like, you know, a cactus in it. <laughs> yeah. A cactus or something. Or like they're ma- Yeah. 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 Exactly. I see that often um, or they'll mix plants that you know in nature wouldn't grow together because they have completely different needs and then you know either one inevitably will die and then that can create you know mold breaking it down and it just becomes a big complete mess so Mm -hmm. really plan out your 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 plants and make sure they're appropriate for the terrarium and then lastly the thing that a lot of people think mistakenly is that a terrarium means you don't have to do any maintenance. And while I say terrariums are easy, it's not, you know, without some work. Plants grow, they change. Um, Naturally, they'll have leaves that get brown and die. You know, keep up your terrarium, keep up the maintenance, trim your plants when they start to get a little bit too high, Um, remove, you know, dead and dying leaves in there um check on it you know weekly let's say just make sure everything's okay just don't let things go and think that everything will be fine because while that could happen it's it's not likely so it's better to keep up on maintenance i love that to wrap up do you have a favorite terrarium that you've built Yes. Yes, I do. That one that I was telling you earlier with the Peperomia Ripple. In fact, I just posted it. You just posted it on Instagram, right? Yeah. Yeah, I commented on it. (laughs) Yeah. I love that terrarium. It's been the easiest terrarium. Like I barely do anything (laughs) with it. And that Peperomia just took over. It is wild. We'll put a picture of it in the show notes. It's a crazy, I mean, it's taken over the the bowl or the the vessel. Yeah, exactly. So I love that one. That's awesome. Well, I'm not going to ask you to choose which type is your favorite because I'm sure your answer is all. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But if I can't recommend you guys following Patricia enough because the you take terrarium building to the next level, the landscapes you create, the scenes you create, it's your account is very relaxing to watch because I just love all the photos so much. So um, as well as your book. So where can everyone find you? We will link to your book. It's called A Family Guide to Terrariums for Kids. So if you have kids, this is a great book. But if you're like me and you just (laughs) want to read as if you're a child, they're also great. But where can everyone find you? I have a website. It's doodlebirdterrariums.com. And I also have a blog attached to the website. So um, not only you'll see you know, things you can buy, but also learn a little bit at the same time with the blog. And then 
on Instagram, like you said, it's um, DB terrariums. And I love to just share like behind the scenes or my plants or my terrariums. So Mm -hmm. you can find me there as well. It's awesome. And yes, you, people could also buy a terrarium from you. So on your website, you sell, what are, what are the things that you sell? You sell a, a pre-made terrariums, right? Yes. Yes. And, um, most of them have like intricate little scenes, water, waterscapes, different things. Um, I also sell a few things that, you know, for DIYers, if they want to make it themselves, I sell a toolkit. So yeah, there's a bunch of stuff on there. And if nothing else, you can go see what, what I do. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Well, we'll link out to everything. Thank you so much. This was so informative throughout this talk. I'm like, man, I need to make a new, maybe for my book launch, I'll make a a growing joy inspired terrarium or scene or something. I would love that. Yeah. I want to see that. For yeah, sure. for sure. So um, you've really inspired me to get back into it because it really is. It's such a precious, fun thing to do and then lovely, lovely thing to have in, in the collection. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Patricia is so awesome. Follow her Doodlebird Terrariums. The photos of her terrariums are unbelievable. I have referenced her book so many times. <laughs> It's it's hilarious. She really breaks down the what like I mentioned in our conversation. She breaks down the water cycle really well. It's a book about terrariums, but it's really it's a great plant care book and it's constantly referenced on my bookshelf. So check her out. All of her links are in the show notes. This was a great conversation. It was really eye-opening and fun fact, Billy is like secretly really interested in doing a paludarium. <laughs> I've caught him watching some paludarium videos on YouTube the other day, which is a big deal because most of the gardening stuff I handle. So I think we have a paludarium or vivarium in our future once we move one more time. I can't wait to set one up for him. It's going to be so cute. As I'm recording this, I'm staring at the small terrarium that I mentioned earlier in today's episode, the one that traveled with me to record my audiobook. It has since traveled with me to several other press opportunities I've had for Growing Joy, and I plan on taking it on book tour with me, so I always have a planty reminder of this community. And speaking of Growing Joy plan friends, if you haven't already, definitely pre-order the book. Thank you to those who pre-ordered. Thank you so much for all the support that I'm feeling as we close in on the pub day of Growing Joy. This has been such a roller coaster. I'm having so much fun and I truly believe that this book is my love letter to plants. And I really hope that everyone leaves after reading the book and cultivates another smile on their face because of it. So plant friends, I hope that you are thriving and enjoying the throes of the gardening season that we are in if you're in the Northern hemisphere. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow plant parent personality test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society rooted in high quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space, off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. 
And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. 
In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 